Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Baijiu's Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well this this Saturday morning. Uh, today we will be covering a, a couple of questions. There will be a few ice breaking questions and post ice breaking questions. We'll very quickly look at your June shift to uh, questions. Some of these questions are important. They're simple. You'd also be able to understand what kind of questions are coming in. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I can see Rizwana, Liji, Shazia, Rupesh, Dulal. Uh, uh, so no, Diti Priya. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, all right. So without uh, further ado, Tahmina, Satya, everybody is joined. Vismaya. Okay. Uh, Rupali is also there. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks so much, Satya, for informing everyone that the class is going to be starting at 9.15. All right. So without further ado, I think let's just very, very quickly get started with today's session, with today's class. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so like I said, today, our primary focus is going to be looking at some important ice-breaking questions. We will be looking at some important ice-breaking questions. These are important. There are a couple of important questions that we'll be covering uh, through the course of this particular video lecture. And post that, we will be looking at your June 2020 uh, evening shift paper, some very important questions. There are about 30 plus questions that we will be covering from your June 2020 shift, okay? So without further ado, I think let's just very quickly get started. Let's just very, very quickly uh, move forward, uh, get started. All right. So, so like I said, our priority is going to be to look at June 2020 shift two. I recommend all of you right after this class, I want you all to sit for one hour at least and try looking at this entire paper. Along with that, please make it a point that you are carrying, you're carrying, a, a, you know, some sort of a manual, your literary manual, your uh, Oxford companion. So it should be on the table. For instance, like you should have your Oxford companion on the table. You should make sure that you you know you're reviewing so whatever uh, questions we are doing whatever topics we are doing you should take a look that is how uh, curious you really have to be keep a literary theory manual with you uh, any literary theory book or keep any history of english literature book with you while you're analyzing these questions okay uh, so without further ado i think and, and like i said after right after this session sit and complete this paper even if it takes you one hour two hour just make sure that you know you are completing and finishing this off like I always say, please stay motivated. I am trying my level best to ensure that, you know, I am trying to energize all of you. Uh, so please feel free. If, and, and also one more thing, because I know that it's exam time. So a lot of times we get a little disturbed. We get a little troubled. Uh, so if, if any of you are uh, facing any problems, please feel free to directly DM me on Instagram, Neerja Raheja 2308. Uh, I have been receiving a couple of these messages uh, of students who are stressed because obviously you're staring at the exam. It's perfectly all right sometimes just speaking to someone makes a lot of difference so please feel free to dm me if in case you have any other concerns but please stay positive that's my only only concern uh, please stay as positive as possible all right so that's the only thing that i'd like to talk about okay uh, also we are going to be uh, pushing the enrollments for our december 2020 uh, foundation batch course so our foundation batch course the express course is going to be starting there are a couple of interesting things that we are doing we are coming up with a lot of async content a lot of your async content will be there and in this async content like for instance currently i'm preparing manuals on modernism postmodernism. so we are adding up a couple of things which will really be very relevant from your examination perspective as well as from your phd entrance perspective right so we are including async content on a couple of important uh, uh, units altogether. so do take a look uh, for structured preparation for the december batch for the december batch any sort of a structured support that you want uh, for english literature uh, please feel free to uh, take a look because we are working really hard to prepare the async content as well okay uh, so let's just quickly move on now oh, oh, oh what's wrong with this just give me a minute this is not moving Okay, here comes your first question. Here comes your first question. Let's just very quickly take a look at the first question. This is your first question, everybody. This is the first question that you are having. Let's just take a look at the first question now. What do you think is the right answer? Please start putting it in the chat box as well. What do you think is the right answer here? Okay. 
absolutely right absolutely right i can see uh, das priyanka uh, aftara they were a few of the people who've answered this question correctly I'm not able to use the pen acha ab ho gaya pehle kya hua tha maine pen pe hi click kar raha tha but uh, ye dekhiye ha acha kaise acha kam karu aise ho jayega aap ho jayega ye dekhiye jaise beech mein अच्छा सेकेंड टाइम पे थो ठीक है थैंक यू सो मच sorry right so absolutely right uh, see uh, here when you're looking at these kind of questions call me mary beaten mary seaton mary carmichael or by any name you please who introduces herself in this particular way we are able to see that the imaginary narrator in a room of one's own is actually introducing herself in this particular way very important for all of us to uh, remember a couple of pointers what are these couple of pointers first of all non fictional prose right writings non fictional prose writings especially of the 20th century has to be covered in greater detail all your important writers who are writing uh, they they become critically crucial from your examination perspective we are able to see that virginia wolf is giving us this street tie so virginia wolf the time coordinates also you have to keep in mind because a lot of times you get questions of set them in order uh, so that really helps all together when is a room once uh, on coming 1929 three guineas is a kind of a sequel to that entire tree tie which is on feminism altogether and what is she trying to talk about she's trying to talk about women's education financial independence and space altogether so dh lawrence's why novels matter virginia woolf's room of one's own three guineas all the important non fictional prose writings i would recommend all of you to spend some time and cover this as much as possible okay so please keep that aspect properly in mind All right. Uh, so moving on to the next question that we are having. So I hope this is this is absolutely clear to everybody. Let's quickly move on to the next question that is coming. Okay, this is just taking a lot of yeah. Goodbye to all that is. Uh, goodbye to all that is the autobiography of which particular person? Again, non-fictional prose writings. Who is the writer who's written the autobiography? Goodbye to all that. Goodbye to all that. And all of you, because your exams are coming close, just say goodbye to uh, all the other sundry things that you're doing. So goodbye to all that. Who's the one who's actually giving that? Yes, Babli. Very nice. Very nice. What is the right answer over here? This is the autobiography uh, which was published. So there was this person who was coming in. Whom are we talking about over here? Who's this person that we are talking about over here? Okay, Sonu has given the right answer. Sonu has given the right answer. Ah, uh, please, please, please don't go wrong with such kind of questions at all. These are very, very scoring ah uh, questions. Whenever we are looking at twentieth century literature, for instance, Robert Graves, of course, becomes really important ah uh, over here in this particular regard. It's not Christopher Isherwood. It's Robert Graves. Okay, it is Robert Graves who's writing this. This is Robert Graves' autobiography. It is published in nineteen twenty nine, the same year as the Room of One's Own. Right, the same year as the Room of One. zone so what we are able to see is that robert graves is publishing this entire work in the same year as a room of one zone this is how you have to remember and correlate and that's the reason i've given you these two questions together so that you have to create see now is the law of association all of you have to study really hard and also remember the law of association because till the time you will not associate things you will never be able to answer the questions correctly please remember that okay uh, so when robert graves was 34 years old he had actually published this autobiography and what we are able to see over here is that he is associated with which branch so if i ask you which 20th century movement in poetry is he associated with he is associated with georgian poetry he is associated with georgian poetry remember kenneth millard is coming up uh, and telling us about georgian and edwardian poetry the earlier 20th century writings classified into edwardian literature edwardian realistic writers novelists who are coming in edwardian plus georgian literature of the early 20th century also becomes very uh, important and these days you do get questions coming in your exams as well from this particular segment okay uh, so here we are able to see 
that Robert Graves is not at all experimenting. He's not an experimental poet. He's rather a conventional poet. Edwardian and Georgian poets were largely conventional. They were trying to uh, just complete the legacy, the chain of legacy that was started during the Victorian age. They're not being very experimental at all. Okay, so please keep that aspect in mind. Do remember that. So this is the autobiography of Robert Graves, right? So Robert Graves is the person who is actually helping us with this autobiography. 1929, that's the key association that you all have to keep in mind basically. Okay, uh, who wrote the provocative book Mother India? Mother India was a provocative book written by, we've actually looked at this question previously as well. So who is the writer writing this pro uh, provocative book that we're able to see? It's an American historian that we are able to look at. So who's this person? Who's this American historian who's coming in? Who's this American historian who's coming in and writing this work? What is the right answer here, everybody, or everyone? It, it And this work is also coming in 1927. So very closely packed works that are coming in. This work is coming in 1927. Yes, absolutely right. Catherine Mayo Mo is the right answer. And please remember that this is actually a very oriental piece of writing altogether. Uh, the social evils of India are laid bare altogether, just like the movie Slumdog Millionaire was trying to do that. Uh, right? Uh, whenever we are able to see a lot of people uh, had written books to counter this perspective, they said that, you know, uh, they, they were just trying to present the shabby aspects of India. They were trying to ignore the other important details altogether. So Mother India is a work written by by Catherine Mo, and this is coming in 1927. So I hope it is clear. Robert Graves' autobiography, 1929. A Room of One's Own, 1929, introduced by a nameless narrator. Then we are able to see that Mother India is a work by the American historian Catherine Mo. Cat Catherine Mo is coming, and she is writing this entire work. I hope you'll be able to uh, remember these dates all together because they're, they're very closely structured. So modernism becomes important, and like I was telling you, because you know um, I've intentionally inserted some of these questions at the very beginning because right now we are working on the async content also for the foundation batch where we are coming up with modules on modernism, postmodernism, and these are very critical units to set a foundation, a fundamental foundation for you in your careers in literature basically. So that becomes really important for all of you. Remember there were a lot of texts that were trying to counter this entire work as well. Okay, moving on to the next question that is coming in. Why is this so slow anyway? Um... Uh, Okay, I think the next question comes in the next century only. Oh God. What's wrong with this? Okay, everyone, this just refuses. Now if I, I'll ring the bell, then it'll suddenly change. All right, I think uh, it's taking a little longer. I'll just call for help. Uh, um, probably it might just change now. Mouse pe teen chaw bhai. Sir, it's as it is very slow, like in. Nee, wo to dekhe nahi ho raha hai. Aur bahut slow bhi chal raha hai. Isse speed thoda ruk rahi hai. Nahi ho raha hai na? नहीं हो रहा है तीन बार और काफी अब टाइम हो गया है शो 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 दिस थिंग सेल डाउन या या जस्ट वेट फॉर टू मिनट्स विच इज ट्राइंग टू फिगर दिस आउट थैंक यू सो मच राइट दिस इज द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन द शॉक डॉक्टरिन बाय नोमी क्लेन इज अबाउट द शॉक डॉक्टरिन बाय नोमी क्लेन इज अबाउट so this is a really important question and these kind of questions of course come in uh, important new theories that are coming in important new theories that are coming in What is the right answer here, everyone? What becomes the right answer, everyone over here? Uh, the subtitle of the shock doctrine is the rise of disaster capitalism. Yes, uh, okay, I, I think I saw the right answer. It is called the rise of disaster capitalism. The rise of disaster capitalism. It's a really good book, the rise of disaster 
कैपिटलिज्म द राइज ऑफ डिजास्टर कैपिटलिज्म इन अ लॉट ऑफ योर सेट एग्जामिनेशन लास्ट टू ईयर्स दिस क्वेश्चन बाई द वे वॉज आस्ट ऑल टूगेदर दिस इज अ बुक विच इज गेटिंग पब्लिश इन टू थाउजेंड एंड सेवन द शॉक डॉक्ट्रिन बाई नोमी क्लैन नोमी क्लैन वॉट इज अ सब टाइटल द राइज ऑफ डिजास्टर कैपिटलिज्म ऑल टूगेदर सो नोमी क्लैन इज अ कनेडियन राइटर एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर वर्क इज टॉकिंग अबाउट न्यू लिबरलिज्म वॉट इज दिस वर्क टेलिंग अस अबाउट इट्स टेलिंग अस अबाउट न्यू लिबरलिज्म लॉट ऑफ यू आर नाउ answering this question correctly this work is entirely dealing with the concept of neo liberalism please keep that in mind now when we are talking about neo liberalism so why is it important see basically uh, you need to understand that there, there are these beautiful books which are written there is a book by uh, by hpr howard business publishing which talks about conscious capitalism uh, so a lot of times even when we talk about the pandemic in the pandemic all the malls were shut but economy still survived because and that shows this is something that our liberal arts professor also used to tell us uh, professor yogang he used to say that whenever we are looking at we we need to survive on the very basic things right but we have created these uh, these uh, uh, these ostentatious demands for ourselves which are not even required so what are we able to see we have now entered high or late capitalistic era where everything is commodity fetishism according to post modern thinkers and marxist scholars that is what they say so all these writers are trying to figure out they are trying to look at alternatives to capitalism and uh, you know something in design thinking also so there is something called design thinking where literature students can again do really well uh, there is a philosophy called the minimalistic philosophy trying to keep the content very so what is twitter what is instagram re what are instagram re these examples of you're trying to keep it as brief crisp as possible it's not that you're going in for ages altogether so uh, a lot of times these theories are giving you alternatives altogether that you have to be very mindful of so this particular work is actually trying to literally give us a sort of an alternate altogether uh, we are able to see that you know it's looking at history it's looking at the history of 1970s it's looking at the iraq iran controversy and then it is postulating a different method instead of capitalism altogether so it is regarding neo liberalism in a particular way uh, the rise of disaster capitalism the shock doctrine it really wants to uh, become more aware uh, it wants us to be more aware about what are the things that are taking place you know basically a lot of wars were going on and they still go on so uh, the the work when we are able to look clen was trying to decode that clen was trying to look at that and clen was saying that you know if you want to be more uh, globally sound then neo liberalism is going to be really important imagine if just just I'll, i'll fight with you but if i know that you are actually going to help me there'll be an exchange there'll be a transference of energy we'll buy something from you you will you will buy something from me you'll sell something to me uh, so in that particular process i will never want to hurt you i'll never want to hurt you that's exactly what india is trying to do in the geopolitical scenario right now india wants to make sure that through modern trading methods we are having peaceful cordial relationships with everybody so that we are at a position where and, and that's a geopolitical scenario so all those uh, of you who are preparing for upsc will be knowing it better as well so beautiful theory altogether if you want to research more about it you can actually do that's a very important good topic for research especially if you're interested in post modernism late capitalism uh, alternatives altogether neo liberalism free market there'll be a lot of economic uh, uh, improvement that you'll be able to see students like him can actually uh, look and consider this book if you want to probably do a research on this okay okay moving on to the next question uh, so quickly moving on to the next question why is this happening okay 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 i think it's not the fault of the oh god Okay here let's let's move on to the next question it isn't language which has a hole in the ozone it isn't language which has a hole in its ozone layer identify the author and the book in which this famous statement appears very very popular statement where is the statement appearing where are we able to see that the statement appears it's a 1995 book that we are able to see what is the correct answer what is the correct answer over here it is in language which has a hole in its ozone layer it is in language 
Yes, uh, uh, I, I can see D as the right answer. Bharti, Bhivas, everyone. Yes, Prashant also. Yes, Ina has also got it right. It's Kate Super in What is Kate Super in What is Nature. Uh, you know, basically, here the book is trying to say that start focusing on environmental issues before it becomes too late. Before it becomes too late, we need to focus on environmental issues. That is what the work is actually telling us about. That's a primary thing that the work is trying to tell us about, that we must focus on nature uh, before it becomes absolutely too late altogether so that is what the book is uh, essentially talking about uh, as it is eco criticism eco critics are important for us because in your net exams you've started getting questions on eco critics the new theories that are emerging altogether just like we saw the shock doctrine the disaster of the late capitalistic period altogether Okay, moving on to the next question that is coming in over here. Let's just see how many of you are able to answer. Which of the following is not a trope? Which of the following is not a trope in Hitler's rhetoric in Kenneth Burke's essay, The Rhetoric of Hitler's Battle? The Rhetoric of Hitler's Battle. The Rhetoric of Hitler's Battle. And these kind of questions do come in your exams, which are trying to probe, which are trying to ask, which are, are trying to uh, ask you questions that are really important in terms of understanding uh, you know, important figures, historical figures of the contemporary world around you. So that is, of course, become of, uh, because, you know, here you're trying to establish a bond that literary studies uh, is also rooted in reality. It's not that we're like Jane Austen uh, in our ivory towers, sitting in silos all together. So who, where are we able to see over here? Yes, I, I can see some of you giving the right answer. So remember when we are looking at Hitler, Menkamp is coming in. Uh, so uh, here you need to understand that, you know, uh, Hitler was a person who had sort of intrigued a lot of people. Why why had he intrigued a lot of people? Because people were getting befuddled. That how come a tyrant is getting so much of support? What is it that is literally ensuring that people are able to see that a tyrant is also getting that sort of support? So uh, in, in his book, my struggle as well we are able to see uh, that you know this is being interrogated altogether. now what you have to remember is that here there are four important tropes there are four important tropes that are being spoken about so which is not a trope which is not a trope inborn dignity is a trope projection device projection device is a trope inborn dignity is a trope projection device is a trope by the way uh, projection device is there symbolic rebirth symbolic rebirth is also there right uh, but please Please remember there is commercial use there is not a prophetic rhetoric is not there there is commercial use commercial use so what is basically what is what is he trying to say Kenneth Burke is trying to say in the rhetoric of Hitler that these are the four important ways through which Hitler was able to persuade all of us right so what we are able to see is that there is an essay that he is writing called persuasion Kenneth Burke is writing this essay called persuasion and in this particular essay on persuasion he says when we are looking at Hitler how is he becoming the stellar hero he is becoming the stellar hero because of the fact that he is having the this 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 quality of inborn dignity projection device symbolic rebirth commercial use so predominantly see i'll, I'll give you this example uh, you look at any leader that you have okay any leader who's been a tyrant you look at governments around the world altogether i'd not like to name but you, you you'll be able to see that so a lot of times these leaders are trying to persuade us right they're trying to give us a growth rhetoric uh, because of that we are not able to see beneath the uh, the veneer of the growth rhetoric what are their ulterior your motives altogether. So that is what Kenneth Burke is trying to look at. Kenneth Burke is trying to look at the rhetoric of Hitler's battle. He is trying to look at how there are these four devices which are persuading us that even we were swayed. We in the sense he's talking about the Germans. The Germans did not contest it at all right so prophetic rhetoric is not a part of it prophetic rhetoric is not a part of it the remaining are the four important qualities that kenneth burke is highlighting which are important for all of us to keep in mind okay so please keep that uh, that aspect in mind these are all important questions uh, that that usually are asked in your exams so it's always a good idea to actually know them moving on to the next question very very quickly here we go to the next question that is coming in going to the ter uh, in going to the territory a volume of seven essay included new perspectives on what is it uh, so so what what is this actually trying to this volume trying to tell us and of course please identify the writer as well going to the territory
oh sorry i'll just add another option please answer it no that's not the right answer so going to the territory is a book by ralph phillison okay this is this is actually a book of uh, essays so basically this is trying to tell us about uh, in 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 the form of an essay it's trying to build a story all together we are able to see that a story is coming in uh, which which is getting weaved all together so it is a work which is coming from the pen of ralph phillison ralph phillison is basically the person who's responsible for this entire work all together you know uh, what we are able to see over here is that a lot of uh, people their their readings of faulkner readings of richard wright their all coming together in this entire collection of essays afro american writers afro american studies afro american so so for instance you get questions coming from say uh, you know caribbean literature uh, they're also in in a way your marginalized literature subaltern literature so to say so they they play a very critical role we need to keep that in mind as well that you will be uh, able to answer it okay you will be able to see these questions in your exams as well so going to the territory a collection of essays by ralph illison right ralph illison is the right answer here this is a really simple question no man's land the war of words is a sequel to which of the following uh, fem uh, feminist test text no man's land is a sequel to which of the following feminist text no man's land is a sequel to which of the following feminist text that we are able to see uh, a brilliant example of how feminist uh, feminism is also going to be coming in as a as a sort of a question for all of you what is the right answer Dulal has given the right answer. Uh, the Mad Woman in the Attic is absolutely the right answer here. So, No Man's Land is a sequel to Mad Woman in the Attic by Gilbert and Gubar. Uh, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar, the writers writing Mad Woman in the Attic, also analyzing the character of Bertha Mason. How women are always given the peripheral roles and responsibilities and duties. That is something that she is trying to talk about also in greater detail. This was fairly a simple question. Let's quickly move on to the next uh, question and expedite our speed as well. All the foundation. Asian bad students yesterday you had a session on new criticism i want all of you to answer this question in greater detail and also write this question down john crow ransoms john crow, crow ransoms elegy bells for john white uh, uh, white side's daughter uh, right so here we are able to see that john crow ransom the same person who's giving us the term uh, of new criticism bells for john white's uh, white side's daughter makes a reference to which of the following works by john dun it is making a reference so when Whenever we are studying new criticism, it becomes mandatory for us to look at metaphysical poets because metaphysical poets are being discussed by most of the new critics. Their poetry is being discussed by most of the new critics. So I think it becomes like a mandatory unit for all of you to complete metaphysical poets and then go on to analysis of your new critical thought altogether. What is the right answer over here, everyone? I can see a lot of you answering, uh, you know, B, D. A lot of you are giving different answers altogether. So, nineteen twenty-four is where bells for White, uh, John White's uh, White Side's daughters coming in. Now, when we are looking at this, please remember it is actually a very uh, anthologized work altogether now. And this particular work is trying to tell us about how there is an unexpected death of a very lively girl. A very very lively girl is passing away altogether, uh, and now she's silent, unfortunately. Uh, so that is something. which is there and it is actually alluding to devotions upon emergent occasions devotions upon emergent occasions devotions upon emergent occasions is a clear cut sort of a evocation so uh, here bells for john white said daughter is telling us that you know there was once an ebullient girl there was once an energetic girl there was once a very lively girl who now is silent who now is silent and this is eternal silence that she has actually been gifted because of death so that That is actually a sort of an evocation where we are able to see. Uh, so you know that there is this uh, line in devotions upon the emergent uh, occasions. If you want to write it down, you can write it down. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Right, so that is where we are able to see. Yes, 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 absolutely right. Anamali Varsi is also saying the right answer. So, so beautiful lines that come in. Never sent to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. 
right? Uh, so, so that is essentially what is uh, being told over here. But please remember, I think I would highly recommend, uh, especially all the classroom students, the foundation batch students. Yesterday only we look, we started looking at new criticism. Before today's lecture, I, I would really appreciate if all of you can also go over metaphysical poetry. It will really help you in the longer run altogether. It will genuinely help you and create that sort of an impact altogether. Okay, moving on to the next question uh, that we are having for all of you. Which of the following works of John Donne contains a defense of suicide? This is a really simple question. Defense of suicide. Which work of John Donne is having a defense of suicide? John Donne, a clergyman also, by the way, do remember that. Yes, by uh, absolutely right. By Thanatos is the right answer. Thanatos as it is means death. Thanatos as it is means death. Remember, Thomas de Quincy is also giving a reply to this. Thomas de Quincy, Thomas de Quincy is also giving a reply to this particular work. So this was written in 1608. It was published posthumously. It was published posthumously. It is actually trying to tell us. Uh, it is trying to tell us about self homicide. Self homicide is also called suicide. Uh, so so that is something that we are able to see and also remember even Borges is talking about it. Borges also talks about the same work by Thanatos. Even he tries to give his opinions about it. So a defense of suicide is by Thanatos, right? The defense of suicide is by Thanatos altogether. So both the works do keep that in mind when we are looking at how uh, Bells for John White, uh, Whiteside's uh, Daughter, which is a work coming by John Crow Ransom, is also getting inspired in a particular way uh, by uh, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions by John Dunn and by Thanatos is a defense of suicide that we are able to see which is coming in. Okay, George Lamings in the def uh, in the Castle of My Skin derives its title from Derek Walcott's poem. Which poem are we talking about? Which poem are we talking about over here? <coughs> Sorry. The Barbadosian writer, the Barbadian writer, George Lamming, coming 1953 is when the book was getting published altogether. Remember, it's a coming-of-age novel altogether that we're able to see in The Castle of My Skin. You can take a look at it as well. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Epitaph for the young is the right answer. Epitaph for the young is absolutely the right answer. Do take a look at this particular work, okay? Uh, do take a look at this particular work over here. Uh, so, Epitaph for the young is the right answer. Now, these were a few ice-breaking questions that we had for all of you. Now, let's just very, very quickly come on to June 2020 evening shift questions, okay? Now, let us try and take a quick tour of your June 20. 2020 evening shift questions. These were your ice breaking questions. Review them, review the topics, review the <coughs> the writers from where we've actually given you the questions. Just try doing all of those things all together. Okay. All right. Uh, let's very, very quickly, let's very, very quickly get started over here. Uh, here we go on with your June analysis. Let's just quickly get started with your June analysis over here. <coughs> Everyone, please quickly tell us uh, what is the right answer here. What becomes the right answer here? Right. Sappho is absolutely the right answer. Who among the following belonged from the island of? Who among the following belonged uh, from the island of Lesbos? Right. Oh, sorry. This one was done. This question was done. So the island of uh, this is also done. 
here we go uh, who among the following belong to the island of lesbos it is sappho that we're talking about and that is how lesbianism also comes in uh, the term altogether uh, so when we are talking about sappho sappho is a really important uh, you know a sort of a lyrical writer who's coming in in the ancient greek uh, civilization famously called as the poetess famously called as the 10th muse altogether uh, that is something that we're able to see and please remember we have all her writings in fragments we are having all her writings that are coming in the form of fragments altogether so here sappho is the right answer just spend even if you spend two hours once on classical literature i think you will be done with it you can spend two hours on classical greek literature two hours on roman classical literature and save up two, two to three hours on indian aesthetics on indian aesthetics that will be really helpful that will be really helpful uh, so so this is something that you can actually look at okay moving on to the next question uh, let's just quickly see how many of you are able to get the right answer who among the following refutes plato's charge that poets are liars poets are liars by arguing that the poet nothing affirms and therefore never lieth this is very simple a question a path breaking work of renaissance criticism renaissance criticism what is the right answer here so and that will give you very simple questions as well you need to be prepared about it so what is the correct answer here plato in his republic is trying to talk about how poets are corrupting the mind absolutely right philip sidney is the right answer we'll not spend a lot of time on this question so philip sidney in the defense of poesy or the apology for poesy remember olney and ponsonby are the two publishers that you are having so olney is there and ponsonby is there so these are the the stuff that if you are looking at your oxford companion you'll be able to answer most of these questions all together okay moving on to the next question who among the following coined the term aesthetics who is the writer coining the term aesthetics coinages words they are going to be important you will get questions that will be coming on these so be prepared for that but what is the right answer here everyone what becomes the correct answer here so sorry Yes, absolutely right. The German philosopher Alexander Bogmar Garten is the person. Gottlieb Bogmar Garten is coining the term aesthetic. So this is a term which is getting coined in the 18th century. We're able to see in his work, which is coming in 1735, he is coining the term. 1735 is where the work is coming in. He is coining the term aesthetics altogether. So please keep that in mind. Aesthetics is somebody having a good taste altogether, a sort of a connoisseur, right? A sort of a connoisseur that of sorts. Okay, moving on to the next question. Who among the following held that people of Hindustan are a race of men lamentably degenerate and base, retaining but a feeble sense of moral obligation? They are degenerate. They are having a feeble sense of moral obligation. Who is this that we are able to see? Who is this that we are able to see? What is the right answer, everybody? Let's just see how many of you are able to answer this correctly. So again, questions on English in India, they will be asked. You do get questions occasionally, not occasionally, but every single time on these quotations also, which are coming in. So be prepared for them also. What is the right answer here, everyone? Yes, absolutely right, absolutely right. So this is like you know one of those uh, very important questions that comes in. Yes, 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 Shalini, the father of English education in India. That is also true. That is also just a second. I'm just tying this in a better manner. Yeah, that is also absolutely true. So one one to two questions from English writings will definitely come. Charles Grant is a British politician and an evangelist. So again, here Charles Grant is the right answer. As most of you are putting it in the comment section as well. You know, he was actually recommending the use of English education, the medium to be English itself. That is what he was recommending, and we are able to see that he was believing in the Anglicist notion altogether. That you should be introducing English uh, as a language to make sure that you're communicating with the natives altogether. together okay moving on to the next question which agency among the following made a distinction between teaching of english as a skill teaching of english as a skill and the teaching of english literature and the teaching of english literature what is the right answer over here everybody what becomes the right answer over here what is the right answer here <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
absolutely right so the education commission education commission 1964-66 is the right answer the education commission is the right answer so basically there are two important things that are being made and this is commonly called as the Kothari commission as well it was headed by Dholat Singh Kothari the chairperson of UGC at that particular time so what is it trying to say it is trying to make a demarcation of teaching of English as a skill and teaching of English as literature altogether and that is the reason even right now you have this basic distinction <clears throat> that is clearly created and demarcated okay moving on to the next question which agency among the following was of the view that use of English use of English divides the people into two nations it is dividing the people into two nations the few who govern the few who govern and many who are governed and many who are governed few are governing and many are governed what is the right answer over here everybody what becomes the right answer over here so what do you think is the right answer here that is uh, going to be the right answer these are three direct questions that have come so you need to actually make sure that you're spending some more time on English in India as well absolutely right absolutely right so basically what you're able to see is that uh, even Dr. Radhakrishnan in November 1948 was trying to talk about the same things that you know uh, it is dividing the nation it is clearly clearly creating that sort of an English versus Hindi dichotomy which still persists by the way in many organizations like the other day I was speaking to a, a person and she uh, she was like you know that here in this particular organization that I am a part of the major divide that I think is the English speaking versus the Hindi speaking divide uh, so unfortunately it still persists unfortunately we're still able to see that there is a dichotomy there is a division between these two categories that is clearly visible so uh, please keep that in mind do remember that that here we are able to see that the education commission is coming up with the the statement okay moving on who is the author of the complete plain words the complete plain words the complete plain words who is the author who is writing the complete plain words so the complete plain words is a work written by which writer so who is the writer who is coming and giving us this entire work on complete plain works altogether? sorry yeah what is the right answer here Yes, Dithipriya, very good. Ernest Gowers is the right answer. It is actually a brilliant work. Uh, even right now, we are able to see a lot of people actually use that, the complete plain words. The other day, I was looking at a video uh, that a friend of mine had shared. She 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 is basically into a different domain altogether. Uh, she helps uh, with, with the cat preparation in terms of all the students. So, I was just seeing her book as well. Like in her title page, she'd actually use the cover of the book, the complete plain words altogether. So, it's a beautiful book all, always. It's never gone out of print. This is a basic book to actually teach you English altogether so that of course becomes uh, critically crucial for all of us to understand so this is Ernest Gowers that we're talking about okay arrange the following novels in chronological order you have to put them in chronological order you don't have uh, you don't have options but you have to put it in chronological order so what is the chronological order that we're able to see what is the chronological order that you're able to look at Take it step by step. Take it step by step. When is the white tiger coming in? When are we able to see the white tiger by Arvind Adiga is coming in? It is coming in 2008, right? So, please uh, always try and, and make sure that Arvind Adiga, Arvind Adiga is the person who is coming up with the white tiger. So, just take it. Ruth Pravar Jhabwala, remember 19, uh, 1975 is when heat and dust is coming, right? Sushmita, you, how can you write down C? How can you write down C? You have to give me the code. You have to give me the code, okay? You have to give me the code. No, 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 no. It is not two. A lot of you are starting with two altogether. RK Narayan is writing a tiger for Mal Malgudi and that is coming in 1983. A tiger for Malgudi is coming in 1983. This is by RK Narayan right this is by rk narayan so please keep that in mind this is coming this is by ruth pravar jhabwala this is coming in 1975 a lot of you are starting with two over here you have to be very careful that it's not two it is not two it is actually four which is the first one it is actually four which is the first one altogether so please keep that in mind and vikram says it's a suitable boy when is it coming vikram says suitable boy is coming in 1993 so if we go by this particular logic if we go by this particular logic what becomes the correct answer what becomes the correct sequence over here so we have heat and dust we are having heat and dust which is coming in right uh, we we are in a position to see that 
Yeah, we are in a position to see heat and dust is the first one that comes in, okay, because it's coming in 1975. Then we have, uh, then we are having a tiger for Malgudi. Then we are having, then we are able to see that your uh, tiger for Malgudi, then a suitable boy is coming in. And finally, Arvind Adhika. Now, the one way to answer this question can also be if you look at the options, even if you don't know a tiger for Mal Malgudi, for instance, right, then it will be a little bit of an issue, but still you can try and situate it. Still you can try and see the combination uh, accordingly. And, and plug and play the correct answers. We'll play with the options also, don't worry. Today our focus is on content, so we'll, we'll work about uh, that as well. Okay. Let's look at the next question. Arrange the following in chronological order of their publication. Their publication. So just arrange it in the order of their publication over here. What becomes the correct answer? <coughs> what becomes the right answer here? Okay, what is the right answer here, everybody? When is when is past and present coming? Past and present is coming in Carlyle's past and present is coming in 1841. This is a work by Carlyle. This is a work by Carlyle. I hope all of you can remember that Thomas Carlyle is the person writing the past and the present that is coming in. Hobbes is writing Leviathan, which is coming in 1651. This is coming in 1651. It is a path-breaking verb work of, of Thomas Hobbes. Right? Man's life is nasty, brutish, and short altogether. John Ruskins and to this last is also very critically important and when is when is this work basically getting published it's just getting published a year before past and present that is 19 Nine, not a year before, actually, sorry, I, I, I got, I, 1960 is the right answer. And The Life of Dr. Samuel Johnson, this is a work that is written by James Boswell. James Boswell is writing that and this is coming in 1791. This is coming in 1791. So the first is Leviathan. Even in the answer choice, it was very clear. It was very, very clear. But the only thing that you had to be sure of was that how Carlyle's work was coming before. And then you were able to see that Ruskin's work was coming in. That was the most important crux over there okay that was the most important crux that was coming in Okay, uh, arrange the following, arrange the following 19th century magazines in chronological order. Your 19th century magazines are critically important. You have to arrange them in chronological order. What will be the chronological order over here? Can you please quickly tell me what is the right answer here? So if you have to put this in chronological order, what will be the correct chronological order that we'll be able to see over here? Edinburgh Review 1802 to, uh, to 1929, right? Edinburgh Review 1802 to 1939 that is where your let's let's just take it one by one let's just take it one by one over here what is the what is the correct publication date for what is the correct publication date for the london magazine the london magazine is founded in 1822 when is it coming in it is coming in 1822 it this this particular yes most of you are answering it correctly as well the quarterly review is coming from 1809 to 18 the quarterly review that you are able to see, it's coming from 1809 to 1967. But 1809 is important for us. You can keep that in mind if you want to keep it. But it is from 1809. When is the spectator? What about the spectator? What are the dates of the spectator? It's beginning in 1828. 1828 is when the spectator is starting. And what about the Edinburgh Review? The Edinburgh Review is getting published from 1802 to 1929. 1802 to 1929. Right. So please keep that in mind. This is how uh, a lot of chronological questions had actually been asked in this particular attempt. Not all 100% of knowledge was required to answer them. Even if you had some tidbits of knowledge and not the precise knowledge of the dates, you were in a position to answer at least 80% of those questions. Right. So that is also the trick. You have to be a little sure, a little uh, more aware about it. So these are certain magazines that are coming during the 19th century that you should be aware about okay moving on to the next question arrange these autobiographical texts in chronological order in chronological order who's writing autobiography of an unknown indian niratsi choudhury niratsi choudhury is writing that i hope you can recollect that when is it getting published it's getting published in 1951 when is it coming? It is coming in 1951. Nirat Choudhury is coming up with this work in 1951. So this is a work by Nirat C. Choudhury. 
Nirat C. Chaudhary is the person who is writing this particular work. My Experiments for Truth is Mahatma Gandhi and this work is getting published in 1927. This is coming in 1927 by Mahatma Gandhi. We've already, we started today's class by looking at an autobiography itself if you can remember that. So please keep that aspect as well in mind. Nantara Segal is writing Prison and Chocolate Cake which is coming in 1954. Nantara Segal, Nantara Segal, 1954, Prison and Chocolate Cake. Prison and Chocolate Cake by Nantara Segal. And My Story, My Story is by Kamala Das which is coming in 1973. This is coming in 1973. Okay, so please keep that in mind. These are all autobiographical works. They can go back to your notes on non-fictional prose as well. Moving on to the next question, arrange the following in chronological order in terms of their publication. In terms of their publication. So please put that across. Thomas Cook's proposals for perfecting the English language. When is it coming? Thomas Cook. So Thomas Cook is writing this. When is this work coming in? What is the correct date altogether? The proposals for perfecting the English language 1742 which is written by Thomas Cook. 1742. This is important because uh, even in your case set exam there was a question related to chronological where a similar question had been included altogether. Uh, what is so you, you have to keep that in mind a lot of you have given the right answer uh, partially right not completely right. So see now look at this now look at this a lot of you are writing 2134 okay. Now this is your answer okay most of you most of you are writing 2134. Let's see whether this is right or wrong. Okay. Let's see whether this is right or wrong and then you'll be able to understand it better that how are we supposed to be answering. No Webster is writing an American dictionary. An American dictionary is written by No Webster. No Webster is the person in the class, in the classroom class when we were talking about American uh, American English. I hope you remember we were talking about No Webster as well. Uh, no Webster, how No Webster is coming in. We had started discussing about American English in the foundation batch class also if you remember. So, no Webster's Dictionary is getting published in 1828. When is this coming? This is coming in 1828. So, 1828 is there. Let me use another colored pen also over here. 1828 is there. 1742 is there. 1828 is there. So, so a lot of times if you, you're able to say 2 and 4, okay, that, that you've given the right sequence over here. But it is not the correct answer. Henry Watson Fowler's Modern English Usage is coming in 1926. Modern English Usage by Fowler is coming in 1926. This is by Fowler. Alright. This is a work which is coming from the pen of Fowler. Fowler. And Eric Patridge is writing Usage and Abusage. That is coming in 1942. Eric Patridge is writing 1942. So now can you just see, now can you just see that if you put it together, you will be able to see over here, uh, you have to arrange it in the chronological order in terms of publication. So if you are actually able to uh, put it across in in, uh, in order of publication, so 1742 becomes the first one. So 2, 1742 becomes the first one. I hope you are able to see that. I, I hope that is clear to everybody. Then your 4 comes in, which all of you had not written it over here. Then your 4 is coming in. After that, we are able to see that your 1 is coming, right? After that, your 1 is coming and finally 3 is coming, right? So that is the correct order. That is the correct order. So don't be in a hurry. I know a lot of you after that had given the correct order as well. Be a little more uh, alert in, uh, you know, a, a lot of people had written me emails before the, uh, like after the attempt that, oh, you know, there were these small little mistakes that we had made. You need utmost presence of mind over there. You need utmost presence of mind over there because you know that is something which will really help you ace and calmness is going to play a very critical role there. Okay. Moving on to the next question. What becomes the right answer here everybody? What is the right answer here? Samuel Daniels, A Defense of Rhyme, 1602. Samuel Daniel is writing it. Samuel Daniel is writing this entire work. So this is a work written by Samuel Daniel. Right, you should know the authors as well. You should know the authors as well. So the next time when the question is coming in, you're more aware about it. Samuel Johnson's Life of Cowley. Right, so all the dates are equally important. But at the same time, don't forget, don't forget to look at the writers. Which centuries are they coming in from? Who's the writer who's writing that? Life of Cowley is coming in 1779 by Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson is a writer who I hope you can all remember. Preface to the Lyrical Ballets. Uh, preface is coming in. So preface is coming in 1790. 
1800. The preface comes in 1800, lyrical ballets are coming in 1798. I hope you can keep that in mind. And Frontiers of Criticism by T.S. Eliot is coming in 1956. This is coming in 1956. So what is the right answer here, everybody? What is the right answer here? Right, right, right. So it is 2314. Some of you are writing, some of you are giving 41. It is 2314. So if you have to put them, put that in chronological order, you have two uh, Samuel Daniels, a defensive rhyme which is coming in. Right. I hope it is clear. Frontiers of Criticism is by T.S. Eliot. This is a work by T.S. Eliot. This is Dr. Samuel Johnson. This is William Wordsworth. Okay. So please keep that in mind. Then you are having your Life of Abraham Cowley, uh, Life of Cowley, which is coming in. Post that particular work, you have your one and finally you are having four. So that is the correct chronological order. Okay. Which of the following is the correct sequence of the stages in empirical research? You don't have the options, but you have to tell me the stages of empirical research. What are the stages of empirical research that we are able to see? What are the various stages of empirical research that are coming across over here? But we have a lot of questions. Let's at least do some more and then maybe we can see what to do. Okay, what is the correct answer? Yes, everyone. And just right after this class again, try and cover this entire paper again so that, you know, it just sticks along in your head for a longer duration of time altogether. What is the correct order over here that we're able to see? Absolutely right. I think some of you are giving the right answer. So uh, whenever we are talking about hypothesis, uh, whenever we are talking about your empirical research, hypothesis is, of course, the first step, right? You are able to see that hypothesis becomes critically crucial. So you are, uh, uh, you are having your hypothesis. It is the entry point of empirical research, right? Uh, the entry point of empirical research over there that is something that we are able to see post that you you actually based on your hypothesis you do the data collection for instance there's a student of mine who's doing her dba right now uh, doctoral of business administration so uh, she has to first give the concept paper so to say post the con concept paper you have to give the literature review so what is a literature review the literature review is telling you about the parameters of your literature reviews your your data collection stage how will you collect the data altogether then your thesis statement is coming in so after that you have your data collection post that based on this you will have your data collection after the data collection you will analyze the data after the data collection is over, you will do an analysis of that particular data, right? Uh, you have collected the data, then what will you do? You will do an analysis of that particular data that you have actually utilized. And that particular analysis will actually lead you towards, towards a sort of a point where you will be validating a couple of your concerns altogether. And then finally, after you've validated your concerns, you have your findings, okay? After you have done your validation, after you have done your validation, you have to validate the finding uh, the analysis as well right whether it is right or not whether it is true or not and finally you have your findings finally you are having your findings all together so what you are able to see is that this process starts from hypothesis it continues or uh, towards your findings all together so from hypothesis your ultimate goal in empirical research is to reach the level of your findings over here right you have to reach to the level of your findings over here so what we are able to see over here is basically the steps are your uh, hypothesis is the first step then data collection is there then you have to do an analysis of that particular data collection that is coming in post the analysis of your data collection what we're able to basically see is that you need to validate that data and after the validation then you are going to share your findings all together so that is something that you're doing okay moving on to the next question that is coming in what is the right answer here everybody this is a really simple one. You have to match the, the poet with the poem that is written by the poet. Very, very simple. So you can also use the elimination method. Try answering most of them. 
so validation of weeping who's the writer who's writing validation of weeping all together validation of weeping is a work which is written by john dunn right this is john dunn that we are able to see who's coming up and writing this andrew marvel is a writer writing the garden remember where he talks about how just go have been the company of yourself nothing otherwise will change in your life so andrew marvel is the person who's actually writing the garden uh, george herbert is writing the collar and vaughan is writing the retreat i hope all of you remember that these are cult works that are coming in uh, 17th century poetry as it is at least the identification questions all of you should get them right if not the in detail in depth questions i think the identification questions everybody should at least target them uh, a target for them okay these are the novels and you have to match them with the characters that are coming in the novels and the characters that are there Remember Barnaby Raj, a tale of the riots of eighty, the a tale of the riots of eighty, tale of the riots of eighty. So, where are we able to see which character is coming in Barnaby Raj? So, in Miss uh, Miss Dolly's character is there in Barnaby Raj, the tale of the riots of eighties. Tale of the riots. Of eighties, remember, uh, of uh, tales of the riots of forties. So what we are able to basically see over here is that you have to match the the person who's coming in. So so uh, all of these works are the works of Charles Dickens, and the characters are of course becoming very very important. Uh, Mrs. Flintwich is a character in Little Dorriet. Little Dorriet is a character, Mrs. Flintwich, who's coming in. Uh, Miss La Crevy, La Crevy is coming in. Nicholas Nickleby, Nicholas Nickleby, we are able to see La Crevy is coming in. La Crevy is a character who comes in. Nicholas Nickleby, and our mutual friend, Mr. Boffin, is there. Mr. Boffin is there, right? Mrs. Boffin is Mrs. Boffin is coming in. So those are the characters and the list that you are having. Okay, uh, the author and the autobiography, the author and the autobiography that is coming in. Uh, who is the writer who is writing memoirs? Memoirs is a work which is coming in 1974. 1974. So this is Pablo Neruda's 1974 memoirs that you are able to see. I'll hide myself so that you can see. Uh, we just did uh, actually, but but let's let's just see all your responses all together. Graham Greene is writing a sort of life 1970. 1971. 1971. A sort of life is by Graham Greene. This is coming in 1971. Doris Lessing is writing Under My Skin. 1994. Under My Skin is by uh, by by uh, Doris Lessing. And Vladimir Nabokov is writing Speak Memory. Speak Memory is 1951. This is a memoir that is coming by Nabokov. So that is the right answer over here. These are all important historical memoirs where you were getting these questions from. These are all the memoirs that are there. Okay, uh, the concepts and the theorists who are coming in the concepts as well as the theorists. This is a really simple question. I think we've done it also multiple times. So, what becomes the correct answer here? Content and expression is by. Is by Henslev. Remember that content and expression. Louis Henslev is the person who's writing this. So, I hope you are very very. Uh, oh, sorry. One second. Right. What becomes the right answer over here, everybody? So, content and expression is by Helmslev. One second. That is the right answer. I hope you can remember that. Competence and performance is by Chomsky. The first one is the correct matched pair that we are able to see. Uh, signifier and signified is by Ferdinand de Saussure, and metaphor and metonymy is by Roman Jakobson. I hope all of you remember that. Uh, I hope this is clearly uh, visible to everybody as well. Classroom students do make a note of metaphor and metonymy because today in the formalism class also we'll talk about it in greater detail as well. Okay, moving on to the next question. The words that are borrowed, the words that are borrowed. What is the right answer here? Cast is actually coming from the Portuguese word. Where is cast coming in from? Cast is coming from the Portuguese word, a word that we are having. So this is actually a word that has been asked from the Portuguese word that is coming. Beef is coming from the French word. Blunder. Beef is coming from the the French word that we are able to see. So it's having French origins. Uh, Norse word is blunder. Blunder is the Norse word, and flak is the German word. 
right so a uh, word loan words as it is is a very important topic loan words becomes an important topics many many a times questions are uh, coming in last paper also we we'd seen that a lot of questions are actually uh, coming in but remember borrowings loan words borrowings that is something that keeps english alive borrowings uh, is something which is keeping english as a thriving language why is english able to survive it is able to survive because it's a borrowed language altogether it's being very quick to borrow words from other uh, language is all together so that is the major reason okay moving on to the next one the text and the author the text and the author what is the correct answer over here what is the correct answer over here the text and the author what is the right answer here nahi thank you mujhe nahi chahiye thank you what is the right answer here everybody Yes, Pereiro Spanish. Jain Devi is writing after Amnesia, nineteen ninety-two. After Amnesia is a work that is coming by Devi. Devi is the person. This is English in India. So English in India, I think we've done four questions right now. So in one paper, they've given you four to five questions on English in India itself. So that makes it an important topic altogether. So please keep that aspect in mind. Uh, Bridge Khatri is writing Indianization of English, nineteen eighty-three. Indianization of English is coming by uh, by Khatri. Khatri is the person who's writing that. Mass of Conquest is by Gauri Vishwanathan and Colonial Transaction by Harish Trivedi. Masks of Conquest and Colonial Transactions. Okay, so English in India, you are able to see that you know these questions are coming in. It's always a good idea to actually know most of these. Okay, moving on to the next question that is there. What is the right answer here, everybody? L C Knight is writing restoration comedy. L C Knight is a writer who's coming up with restoration. Oh, sorry, one second. I hope you you cannot see that. So L C Knight is a person writing restoration comedy, uh, the reality and the myth. Uh, Trilling is writing the sense of the past. The sense of the past is a work written by Trilling. Trilling is the person. Oh God. Chilling is a person writing sense of the past. Elsie Knight is writing restoration comedy. Matthew Arnold is coming up with a study of poetry and AC Bradley. The 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 study uh, sorry poetry for poetry's sake is by Bradley. Poetry for poetry's sake is by Bradley. Bradley is also somebody that we studied in yesterday's class. I hope you remember when we were talking about Bradley and Ketteridge being people whom formalists are absolutely against. Bradley and Ketteridge. Remember, formalists are against Bradley and Ketteridge. That is what we had talked about. They are against the Bradleyan school, which was looking at the context altogether. This is something that we were discussing. So you can make a note of that over there in your notepads. Uh, okay, the terms and the theorists. The terms and the theorists. What is the right answer here? The terms that are coming in and the theorists. who are there what becomes the right answer heteroglossia 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 was introduced in discourse in the novel this term was introduced by bakhtin in discourse in the novel discourse in the novel is where we are able to see that the term heteroglossia is used that is where your oxford companion to critical theory becomes really very ha handy heterotopia was introduced by foucault foucault is introducing this term heterotopia grand narrative by lyotard lyotard is a person who's coming up with the concept of grand narrative and foucault is coming up with heterotopia and interpolation is by louis althusser altogether right so please keep that in mind these are the terms that are coming in a very important uh, uh, you know so, so literary terms literary theories these are questions that are constantly asked as well so you will ideally have to prepare that in greater detail okay this is really simple the writer and the works this is very very simple a question that is coming in So, what is the right answer? Ferdinand is a sure course in general linguistics, nineteen sixteen, posthumously published as a course in general linguistics. Remember, very to important turning point. Uh, Edward Safir is writing language, nineteen twenty one. Edward Safir is writing language, nineteen twenty one. Course in general linguistics is by Ferdinand is a sure getting published posthumously altogether. Of grammatology is a very important work by Jacques Derrida, and Roman Jacobson is writing two aspects of language and two types of. 
aphasic disturbances two types of aphasic disturbances so that is the correct answer coming from your unit on language and structuralism as it is your unit on language has to be read with your unit uh, in paper 1 that is communication you can read it with uh, additionally you will have to revise structuralism properly post structuralism properly why because you also have structural linguistics you're also having structural linguistics so structuralism and formalism they are very important for your unit on language they are very very important for your unit on language structuralism as well as formalism and classroom students because you have a foundation batch class today at 9 o'clock please do make a note of all these because they'll be really helpful in your classroom studies as well for today okay <coughs> institutions <laughs> I'm so sorry. Institutions and their locations. Uh, the Bandargarh Oriental Research Institute is located in Pune. It's beautiful, really nice. In an Institute of Advanced Studies is located in Shimla. Again, really nice. Uh, in an Institute of Advanced Studies, it's in Shimla. This is in Pune that you are able to see. National Library of India is located. So uh, you you have the Nehru Memorial Museum and the library that's located in New uh, New Delhi, and uh, National Library of India is located in Calcutta. right so nehru memorial uh, museum and library that is in new delhi that is in new delhi and national library of india is in calcutta so again important aspects these are all coming under research as well right these are all important uh, uh, areas or you know bodies that are helping us in research as well okay moving on to the next question that we have for all of you what is the right answer over here when two of the following when two of the following plays were written which two sorry beg your pardon which two of the following plays was written by john osborne there are two plays that are coming from the pen of john osborne what is the right answer So there is another British playwright. He is writing two plays amongst this list. That's Joey Orton. Absolutely right. Deja Vu is the right answer. Most of you have got this right. Absolutely right. So when we are when we are looking at look back in anger, please remember it's a torchbearer, playful, angry young man movement altogether that is coming in, telling you about the frustrations of the people, the economic uncertainty that they were a part of, and even Deja Vu. Deja Vu is also there. Please keep that in mind that uh, when we are talking about Deja Vu, it actually Deja Vu it actually bought Jimmy Potter's character. the back jimmy potter's character was now a middle aged drunkard person who was coming in whereas the other two plays loot and funeral games these are plays that are coming from the pen of joey orton so look back in anger and deja vu these are play by plays by john osborne and both of them are in a way connected because you have the character of jimmy potter you have the character of jimmy potter in both these plays the character of jimmy potter is coming in both these plays all together so please remember that Okay moving on to the next question that is coming in what is the right answer here what becomes the correct answer here I like a lot of questions but let's just cover some more and then I'll call it a day okay right so what becomes the correct answer here everybody yes 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 absolutely right absolutely right deja vu was unsuccessful that's true in which two of the following plays does the blind seer tiresias appear tiresias is appearing in oedipus and antigone oedipus and antigone we are able to see that tiresias character is coming tiresias is a blind seer right uh, tiresias is a very important figure who can see just like cassandra is also a figure who can actually foretell the reality altogether so sophocles oedipus the king and antigone sophocles is the playwright writing both these plays right we are able to see that sophocles Tiresias is the person, and in both these plays, the character of Tiresias is coming. Tiresias is the blind seer. Blind seer. Seer is a, side, a sort of a soothsayer who can see the future, predict the future altogether. having wisdom sophia which two of the following poems by hene came under his bog poem see me see me hene the nobel prize winning irish poet what are the two poems which are a part of the bog poems all together he was awarded the 1995 nobel remember uh, the bog poems have irish influence all together which are the two bog poems that are there 
प्लीज रिमेंबर पनिशमेंट एंड टोलमेंट मैन पनिशमेंट एंड टोलमेंट मैन आर द टू वेरी फेमस बॉक पोयम्स फ्रॉम दिस लिस्ट दैट इज कमिंग इन एज इट इज आई बीन टेलिंग यू दैट आयरिश लिटरेचर ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी आयरिश लिटरेचर और आयरिश लिटरेचर अदरवाइज यू विल डेफिनेटली बी एबल टू सी टू टू फोर क्वेश्चन टू टू थ्री क्वेश्चन कमिंग डायरेक्टली फ्रॉम आयरिश राइटर्स इट्स अ ह्यूज इंटरेस्टिंग बॉडी एंड दैट इज द रीजन यूर रॉटलिट ऑल्सो सीज हिस्ट्री रॉटलिट हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंग्लिश लिटरेचर ऑफ बोथ आयरलैंड एंड ब्रिटेन Uh, so that is the major aspect okay moving on to the next question which two poems which two poems can i not yeah Okay, what becomes the right answer here, everybody? Which two poems in the following list are odes written by? Have we done the previous question? Oh God! Okay, right. What is the correct answer here? Uh, I think I'd given you. Yeah, this is the right answer. Uh, like this is the right question. What is the correct answer here, everybody? Yes, Andrew marvels upon uh, Cromwell's return from uh, Ireland and Alexander Pope's ode, ode on solitude. They are written in Horatian manner. They are both written in Horatian manner. So both two and three are the right answers. Both two and three are absolutely right. Two and three are written in Horatian manner altogether. They are written in Horatian manner altogether. Horatian notes are shorter. They are calmer. They are more meditative in nature altogether. Uh, so that is what. we are able to see they are written in horatian manner over here that is coming in okay moving on to the next question that we have for all of you let's just quickly move on to the next question which two of the following are interludes in john gall's worthies the frost saga the frost saga which are actually the two interludes that we are able to see again a uh, very important question from the pgt tgt examination perspective 1922 frost saga number of novels and interludes are coming in which are the interludes that we are able to see over here that are coming in so sorry Right, the Indian Summer of Frost and Awakening. That's absolutely right. The Indian Summer of Frost and the Awakening. These are the two interludes that we are able to see that are coming in over here. Okay, moving on to the next question. Moving on to the next question, which two of the following novels are a part of Paul Auster's The New York Trilogy? Paul Auster's The New York Trilogy. Paul Auster's writing The New York Trilogy. Which two are the part of The New York Trilogy that we are able to see? Anglo Irish novelist again uh, we we so so please please remember that uh sorry sorry Paul Auster's question is there Where is the right answer here everyone Paul Auster Paul Auster Yes, two and three are, is absolutely right. Ghosts and the locked room. Ghosts and the locked room. They're a part of the New York trilogy that we're able to see. Uh, remember, the first part is City of Glass. The first part is City of Glass that we that is coming in. Uh, City of Glass is the first part. City of Glass is the first part that is coming in. And then you have the Ghosts and the locked room. Then you are having the Ghosts and the locked room. These are the three parts that are coming in, right? Uh, so here, Paul Auster's writings are of course becoming critically crucial. Uh, let's just do one or two more questions and then i'll i'll call it a day and then you can just take a look at this paper again uh so let's just quickly move on to the next question that is coming in polaster we've done This is the next question that is coming right in front of you. Which two of the following are a part of Virginia Woolf's collection of autobiographical essays? Virginia Woolf's autobiographical essays, which are a part of the autobiographical essays that we are able to see. So these are autobiographical essays that are coming in. What is the right answer here, everyone? 
I am a snob is actually really well written also. Okay, a sketch from the past and I am a snob. A sketch from the past and I am a snob. So these are Virginia Woolf's autobiographical essays that we're able to see. So again, very in-depth questions that are coming in, right? Very in-depth questions that uh, that uh, that were asked. So some of these chronological order questions, some of these pick the odd one out questions. You know, they are also critically important because you'll be able to see a lot of other uh, aspects that are actually being asked altogether. There are a couple of uh, other questions. That have been included over here uh, but what I would recommend is I would recommend so a lot of questions are there you can all practice those questions so let's just cover one or two more let's just cover one or two more and then I'll call it a day but do uh, review the June 2022 addition over here uh, in his self-reliance which two qualities does Emerson refer to as the chance uh, the chancellors of God which two uh, is he referring to as the chancellors of God he's talking about the chancellors of God so which two is he talking about which two is he talking about? So, so uh, the two qualities that he's referring to as the chancellors of God, the chancellors of God. So Emerson, a transcendental philosopher, he's stressing on the need to follow your own path instead of conforming the herd mentality which was happening. <laughs> okay, this either don't worry. Let's just let's just cover uh, a majority of them, and then we'll we'll call it a day. Don't worry about that. To put the low power battery mode on. Yes, everyone, what becomes yes? Two and four is the right answer. The cause and effect, right? Even your Buddhist philosophy, that is actually based on the philosophy of cause and effect altogether. So please remember that. That is, of course, there. Uh, which two of the following uh, was published in the year 1859? 1859, which are getting published in 1859? 1859 is a transformational date altogether. I hope you all remember because Darwin is coming up with his theory and analysis all altogether. Origin of two species is coming in. Which other work is coming? It is actually telling you about the French Revolution. So, Tale of Two Cities and On the Origin of Species, both are coming in 1859. Both these works are coming in 1859. You could have used the elimination method as well, right? You could have used the elimination method as well. Which two of the following are non fictional works by Peter Acroyd? Peter Acroyd, again important, Peter Acroyd. Which are the two works by Peter Acroyd? Which are the two works by Peter Acroyd? So, Peter O'Croyd, which two works are we able to see are associated with Peter O'Croyd altogether? What is the correct answer here, everyone? Peter O'Croyd. Let's just do two to three more questions and then I'll just call it a day. The two, two uh, works, Escape from the Earth and the English Ghost. Escape from the Earth and the English Ghost. These are the two works that are there by, these are non-fictional works that are coming from Peter Ackroyd's book altogether, right? Uh, you know, basically what, what uh, you're, you're able to see that the sightings of ghosts is literally being covered in the English Ghost and Escape from the Earth is also trying to tell you about the explorations of space that is coming in. Very interesting work altogether that is coming. Okay, uh, the two of the following works that are Daniel Defoe's historical narratives, Daniel Defoe's historical narratives, which are Daniel Defoe's historical narratives that we're able to see, historical narratives of Daniel Defoe, the historical narratives of Daniel Defoe, what is the right answer here everyone? Journal of the Plague Year 1722. Journal of the Plague Year 1722. It is telling you about the experiences of a man during the 1665 bubonic plague. 1665 bubonic plague and memo, uh, the, the memories of a cavalier. This was published in 17, uh, 1720. So both of these works you are able to see and it's telling you about the 30 years period from 1618 to 1648 altogether. So right. Journal of the Plague Year and Memoirs of a Cavalier. These are the uh, two important important works that are coming. These are historical narratives by Daniel Defoe, right? These are the historical narratives of Daniel Defoe. Uh, just take a look at uh, all the other questions that are there in the, the second shift. That, that would be my recommendation to everybody. Just take a look at it. Have a sneak peek. Have a basic understanding of all of them. Uh, take a quick look at all of them as well. Uh, what I would highly recommend is that keep your companions with you. Uh, uh, do a proper thorough analysis. That is something which is really required as well. And post a proper thorough analysis, you'll be able to understand what kind of questions and patterns are coming in. Okay. But do review, do revise. That is something which is critically important because without that, 
uh, I don't think it will be really helpful at all. Uh, additionally, I will keep on posting uh, questions. I I'll be sharing the PDF of the week, by the way, uh, today. And how, how we'll do it is that I'll, I'll share the PDF of the week. And this is especially for the students preparing for the December attempt. It will be uh, highly, highly useful altogether for everybody uh, who is preparing for Yeah, I don't know. Why is this not getting removed? Okay, right. So uh, anyway, that, that's not the question. Uh, that's not the point as well. What I would recommend all of you is, uh, I, I would recommend all of you to go over the June 2020 uh, shift to paper properly. Uh, just take a look at it, take a tour of it. It's, it's a really simple paper, not that difficult at all. We'll cover some more questions from the June 2020 shift tomorrow as well. Some of them which are really important and the ones that we've not covered today. Uh, so that is something that we'll be looking at. Just do cover it. I will be sharing a PDF of the week. Uh, just try taking a tour of the PDF of the week as well and how we'll go about it is that over the weekend I will try to discuss that PDF as well with all of you all right uh, I have already started uh, sharing how can you prepare your notes etc I'll try to give different samples of notes also um, uh, over uh, over the telegram platform so please stay connected over the telegram platform any sort of other details also uh, which are there related to your exams which are relevant any other thing that I have to share I will share it on the telegram platform it's Nisha English UGC net uh, otherwise if there are any other concerns questions please feel free. Like I said, you can directly message me uh, on Nisha Raheja2308 on Instagram or you can mark me an email. Um, but please feel free to be very, very, uh, you know, motivated, positive, uh, push each other. Uh, try to make sure because I'm really looking forward to interviewing all of you when you clear your exam. So that is something which is critically important. And keep your companions, keep, a, keep these three books, like, you know, a companion, a literature history of English literature with you as well as keep uh, you know a book with you uh, for for English criticism of uh, English literature for world literature for literary criticism and theory just keep it at all times so that whenever you're practicing questions you can go over that topic in greater detail all right thanks so much everyone take good care of yourselves and if in case you're having any other uh, concerns problems please feel free to message me directly thank you thank you uh, all right on that note we will we'll wrap up today's lecture then thank you